Okay, here's part two of lecture 13b, where we'll do a little bit more hypothesis testing on the means with just a couple more complications added to it. And they're really not that bad because it's related to the stuff we've already talked about for confidence intervals. So for this example, this is a little bit different because we'll have what we call a two-sided hypothesis here. So take a moment, read the problem. We have the number of trips an ambulance takes in a given day. We assume it has a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda 5.9 trips per day. Again, keep track of the units associated with the parameter because ultimately you're going to be drawing conclusions in the context of the problem you're interested in. And so we're talking about ambulance trips, so we want to not lose track of what this problem is really about. So we gather 60 days worth of data and we observe a sample average of 6.7 trips per day. Keep in mind the way I've worded this here, that's X bar in this problem, right? I haven't given you the symbol for it. You need to be able to parse that out of the words. The sample average is the sample mean is X bar. Is there evidence that the average number of trips per day has changed? So that word changed is kind of a loaded word because that can mean two different things. Change can mean it got higher or it can mean it got lower. Test at the level alpha equals point. <clears throat> excuse me, 0 0.005. Careful, there's an extra zero in there. We have a low type one error rate that we've calibrated here. So yeah, what does change mean? Increase or decrease? Well, it means either one, right? So when we write our hypotheses, the null is that lambda is equal to 5.9 trips per day. That's the status quo. That's what we've assumed from here on out versus the alternative that lambda is not equal to 5.9 trips per day. So this is how it looks just slightly different than the problems we've done before and that we have a not equal to sign as opposed to a greater than or a less than sign. So the only thing that's gonna change is our rejection region. <clears throat> So in this problem, we've assumed that X is representing one day's worth of ambulance rides. We assume that follows a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda, and we've used the Poisson many times. We know that means both the expectation and the variance of that random variable are equal to lambda. Now keep in mind here, we're just talking about one day's worth of ambulance rides at a time. But when I talk about X bar, which is a good estimator for lambda hat in this problem, right? So E of x bar is still lambda, but the variance of x bar, remember, is now lambda over n. We've seen this many times before as well, that when you have the sample mean, the expectation of the sample mean is the same as the expectation of the individual days, and the variance of the sample mean is the variance of the individual days divided by n. We've seen this many times before. So then the central limit theorem tells me that I have this nice sampling distribution, x bar minus the mean lambda divided by the variance, the square root of x bar over n. Keep in mind, I'm using x bar as lambda hat. And because it's the mean and the variance, I can use x bar for everything. So then where I have my lambda hat over n here is x bar again. And so when I standardize that, I get a normal 0, 1 as for by the central limit theorem. So the question then is, where's the rejection region? Remember, my alternative hypothesis is that lambda does not equal 5.9. So where's the rejection region in this case? Here's my hypotheses again, just as a reminder. And so we reject if our observed Z statistic, and it's a Z because I have a normal for my sampling distribution, is very far away from zero, because that would mean that we have evidence that the ambulance rides per day has either increased or decreased, either above or below. So let's draw a picture of this real quick. So where's the rejection region? So the main difference in problems like these is that the rejection region then is disjoint. It has two pieces to it. Remember, because I have that unequal to sign in my alternative hypothesis, I can have evidence either way above or way below average that would cause me to reject my null hypothesis. So what you got to keep in mind, very similar to what we did with the confidence interval, is that my alpha 0 0.005 then has to be split into two pieces for the above and below. So the percentages where I've drawn these, it should be Point zero zero two five, which is 0.25% above and below those cutoffs that I've drawn. So the only difference then with the two-sided hypothesis is you have to split your rejection region into two pieces and then divide your alpha by two. 
which is exactly what we did for the confidence intervals. So this really isn't too different than what we've done before. So the rejection region is disjoint, as I said before. So we use Q norm 0 0.005 over two, and it turns out that that's 2.81 and negative 2.81 is where I drew the cutoff stent on my picture there. And I typed Q norm into R to get those values for what we have. So that's the only adjustment we have to make. So then my rejection region is gonna be a little bit further out than it would have been ordinarily just if I had a one-sided hypothesis, as in I had a less than or a greater than sign in my alternative hypothesis. Remember, I looked at the alternative to see where the rejection region is, and that's what we always do. So we just gotta plug some numbers in then. X bar minus my Z statistic observed. It's a Z because I have a standard normal sampling distribution is X bar minus lambda divided by square root of X bar over N. Keep in mind, this statistic here is special. What do I plug in for lambda? Whenever I do a hypothesis test, no matter when I'm doing a hypothesis test, I assume the null is true. So in that case, I plug in 5.9 for lambda because that's what I'm assuming is the truth. And I'm using X bar twice just because this is a Poisson. We don't always do that. That's just because in this very particular problem, I'm talking about a Poisson distribution, which is where the mean and the variance are the same. So that's why X bar is showing up twice in this problem. And then the 60 was the number of days worth of data I collected again. So you get 2.39 as your observed Z statistic. So where does that fall? Well, remember my rejection region was beyond 2.81 or negative 2.81. So 2.39 does not fall beyond those cutoffs. So I fail to reject the null hypothesis in this context. I do not have evidence that the average number of trips has changed from 5.9. Keep in mind, you can't say, you know, you can't go back and change the goalposts either. Meaning you can't go back and change what you were trying to show. Your, your hypothesis was about changing. So even though my X bar was higher than that, the evidence kind of points to ambulance trips increasing, but you can't go back and change your hypotheses once you've looked at the data. That's unethical. So example two then, what makes this one a little bit different is that we are testing on two means at a time. Now we have created confidence intervals for two means at a time, right? And even though you didn't see that on exam two, um, you know, we kind of took it easy on you. You know, I don't mean to say that like we did you a favor, you know, after all the chaos of the, the pandemic and everything, but expect to see something about a confidence interval on two means on your final exam. We didn't ask about that just yet for the second exam, but it's still something important that you should expect to see at another time. So we develop a drug to increase lung efficiency. We have 100 patients enrolled in a trial, uh, 100 each for the drug and the placebo. And so the 100 patients show an increase of 3.72 milligrams per liter of oxygenation with a sample variance 0.38 milligrams squared per liter squared. The placebo group, also with 100 people, show an increase of 3.12 with a sample variance of 0.92 milligrams squared per liter squared. Is there evidence the drug is superior to the placebo? Let alpha equal 1%. So keep in mind the word superior here has a direction to it, doesn't it? Superior means better. So we're gonna have a one-sided hypothesis in this context for the alternative hypothesis. So we did a couple with the unequal then, or I'm sorry, the unequal to for a two-sided hypothesis, but we're back to one-sided for this problem it's because of that word superior here. That just refers to one direction. So let's make a couple assumptions that oxygenation is normally distributed and that the variances are equal for drug and placebo. Now that should make you think of the pooled variance like we did for the confidence interval. Right, And so to write your hypotheses, the, the null hypothesis is that the mean of the drug and the mean of the placebo are equal to each other. So subscripted capital D is for drug, capital P is for placebo. So my null hypothesis is that the means are equal for both, but we want to rewrite this. And so here's the key takeaway for when you are making a confidence interval based on two mean parameters. Rewrite your hypotheses as a difference. And the reason for that is it allows you to write the sampling distribution more easily. So even though my hypothesis looks like mu d equals mu p, that's logically what you would think if my hypothesis is that the two means are equal to each other, rewrite it as the difference being zero. And we'll see why in just a minute. And so then my alternative, remember I wanted to show whether, oops, where'd I go? 
whether the drug is superior to the placebo. So my alternative is going to reflect what I'm trying to show so that the mean of the drug is greater than the mean of the placebo. So I'm going to rewrite that just like I did as a difference being greater than zero. The reason we do that is because now we can write a sampling distribution. And this is the same sampling distribution we used before with the pool of variance. Remember, we made the assumption that the variances were equal and my data were normally distributed. That points us to the pooled variance. So that's what I'm going to use as my, in my uh, test statistic. So this formula should look familiar. But keep in mind, now that we're doing hypothesis testing, we have to plug in numbers for all of these. What do we plug in for mu d and mu p? Well, I don't hypothesize what those values are, but I do hypothesize that their difference is zero. So I don't know what to plug in individually for mu d and mu p, but I do know that mu d minus mu p is equal to zero. So that's why it was important to rewrite the hypothesis as a difference, because then this whole piece here is zero, according to my null hypothesis. They could both be 50, they could both be 40, whatever it is, their difference is zero. So then, I can do a little bit of arithmetic and compute the pooled variance. And so that's just a formula to plug some things in. So that's the arithmetic that you get for the pooled variance. And then your T statistics, so 0.65 milligrams squared per liter squared is my estimate of the variance, sigma squared. Remember, because I'm assuming the variances are equal for the drug and the placebo, I only have one estimate of the variance. That's why I use the pool here. Then my observed T statistic. I can plug in values for all these things, x bar d and x bar p were 3.72 and 3.12 respectively. That was given to you in the problem. Mu d minus mu p is zero. That's what got plugged in over here then. And then my pooled variance was 0.65 divided by 100 each in the placebo group and the drug group. So we get 5.26 for our t observed. What was the rejection region? I encourage you to draw a picture again. Uh, in fact, I don't want to I don't want to be a hypocrite here and tell you to do it and not do it myself. So let's draw a rejection region real quick. I have a T198 is my sampling distribution. And my alternative hypothesis is one-sided, that the difference is greater than zero. So that means on the right side of things is where I'm going to have my rejection region. With an alpha level of 1%, that tells me that where this cutoff occurs is where 1% is to the right and 99% is to the left. So I need QT of 99%. which is why I have used the QT function of 0.99 with degrees of freedom should be 198, not 99. So what is QT 99, 198? Did you see the small mistake I made in there? I use the wrong degrees of freedom. So my cutoff occurs then at 2.35. Well, that didn't change it very much, did it? And the reason for that, remember, is as I get more and more degrees of freedom in a T distribution, it gets closer to a normal distribution. So that barely changed it in this case. Uh, either way, my observed T statistic of 5.26 lies beyond the cutoff region that I drew there at 2.35. So we do reject our null hypothesis and conclude the drug is superior to the placebo. So a couple suggestions to try on your own. Number one, how would the problem change if we couldn't assume the variances are equal? Remember, what did we do in that context? Rather than use the pooled variance, we used the two S squareds. So I would have to tell you what the S squareds were, which I did for this problem. And the only thing that would change then would be the degrees of freedom that we use. Remember, that was where that Satterthwaite equation came in. And it was kind of an ugly equation to compute, but you would plug in all those numbers to figure out how many degrees of freedom you'd use. 
How else would this change if instead of the T198, we use the standard normal? Keep in mind, as you collect more data, the sampling distribution of X bar is going to get more normal. So a T198, that's a lot of degrees of freedom to have. It's not gonna be very different from a normal zero one. So the problem's not gonna change very much if you do that part, if you do either one of these, but it's good to know how to do both of these. So then the last summary points I wanna make here is when you are hypothesis testing, whether it's one-sided or two-sided, on one means, on two means, whatever hypothesis test you're doing, write the sampling distribution and sketch a picture of your rejection region. I strongly recommend that. When you're doing two-sided tests, look to the alternative to see whether it's one or two-sided. You're looking for a less than or greater than sign in a one-sided test or an unequal sign in a two-sided test. Adjust the rejection region to be one or two-sided accordingly. So the only difference in these one and two-sided tests is where the rejection region occurs. When you are testing with two mean parameters, the mu d and the mu p, or maybe we have two proportions like we've done before, write the hypothesis as a difference because then you can correctly write the sampling distribution because without the sampling distribution, you can't do any of this. So write the hypothesis as a difference. One parameter minus another parameter equals zero usually. And um, you can also test a two-sided test with a confidence interval. If in the previous problem with the drug in the placebo, we had created a confidence interval for the difference in means, which we know how to do, we did that before spring break, you could use that to look to see whether the true difference fell inside the confidence interval or not. And in this case, with the hypothesis test, we're assuming that's zero. So you would create the confidence interval and then test to see whether zero falls inside it or not. And we'll do a little bit more on that later, just to show you exactly what I mean. But I bet a lot of you are already kind of a step ahead of me with that. So thank you for watching. Thank you for your attention. This uh, lecture check is due before Friday, which would be April 3rd, I believe. Yeah, Friday, April 3rd before 11.59 p.m. All right, have a good week or day or afternoon or whatever.